So, amen. So, good morning, church. We want to encourage you to spend more time with God. How many here doing that? Wave at me. Amen. That's the only way that God really can get us ready for what's happening. A lot of people right now are confused because they don't know if we're in the tribulation. They don't know what's before the tribulation, where we're at, only because maybe they're not searching the scriptures. You shouldn't be moving me at all. And if you're searching the scriptures, what does the Bible say? Jesus said, if you search the scriptures, they that are that testify of me. So I'm, I'm, I'm amazed today. Um, God said to me, he says, the way to notice if people are re being revived towards him is there is an overall tremendous hunger for the word of God. People today are not going after the word. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, being right with him in Christ, and all the things you have need of will be added unto you. Amen. So we're living in really different times, but sitting down with God is he who's going to condition us for the time that we're living. Now let me ask you, if God said, get in the boat, we're going to the other side, what are we going to do? If God says, I have a protection for you that no weapon formed against you will prosper, then God meant that you are protected in such a way that no weapon formed against you will prosper. What I want to say to you as we get started in this is God is very serious about his word. Very, very practical in backing his word and will stand heaven and earth on end to make sure that he keeps his word to us. But there are things in the Word of God that point out some areas of caution for you and I, and that is to have the wrong concept of God, to misunderstand maybe who God is or how he operates with us. And because of bad concepts, and we know who's behind that, we have a bad understanding and often act out of fear rather than faith or trust. Remember the man with the one talent? Remember he said he thought that God was an austere man, that he reaped where he didn't sow? Let me ask you this question. Has God ever been unfair? Has God ever been flawed, imperfect? No. So the man's concept of who God was was distorted. And what I'm trying to say is God is getting the church ready all over the world. And we're not to have a distorted understanding of God, but a clear understanding. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. So basically, the important thing is for you and I to realize God will not let anyone say that he is not a man of his word. The scripture says, I'm not a man that I should lie Neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he not spoken it? Will he not make it good or bring it to pass? So we have to begin to trust God. will do what he says he will do. Because he said certain things for us to fill our hope. And to fill our ideas. So that we can begin to trust him. Because let me see the hands. Has God ever let you down? Why do we always in the back front sometimes as Christians always think that God might want to pull something on us? No, what I want to tell you is God gave me this for you to understand that you're in the most crucial time in this, this day and age that we're living. And you're in the, the time where he's getting ready to gather his church home. And to do that, he's got to gather the flock unto himself. So there's a sifting going on. I'm going to prophesy a little bit to you. A sifting to those that are sold out and those that are still dating Jesus. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? If God said do this, will you do it? Or will you just pray about it? Are we sold out to really follow God? To really believe God's word? Or are we just simply being religious and we don't want to do that? So... Let's begin to find out what God wants. So, so welcome to our briefing. I'm excited to give this to you. I know some of this might sound basic, you know, but I discovered something a long time ago. The longer I walk with God, the basic things that I thought were basic 
really weren't basic at all. They were a necessity of the very life that you and I live in Christ. Amen. So, a couple of things. Today we're going to see what God did and is doing through his son, Jesus Christ. We want you to show or excuse me, we want him to show you Jesus in his fullness today as the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. Someone say amen. amen. So a couple of points I want to give you out. Number one, first we need to get you yoked up with Christ. You can't visit Christ when you want to. If you're really going to need the wisdom of God for today, how to stay healthy, how to resist evil, then you're going to have to get yoked up with Christ. And many Christians today are kind of, you know, just kind of going around. We got to get you hooked up. We got to get you yoked up. That means you give him the keys to your car. He drives. You ride. Can you say amen? Two, rest in order for us to find rest in our soul, it comes only by placing ourselves daily in Christ's hands. Daily. Settling in then by trusting him and in the choices that he helps us make or the choices he makes for us. I know that God can see 360 he can see from the beginning to the end. And when I turn my life over to him and I ask him to help me make choices, I know the choices he's going to make are going to be perfect. How about you? God's choices for us are always perfect. We know the wisdom of God is first peaceable, easy to be entreated, full of good fruits, so everything that God does and everything God speaks into our life is perfect. He is perfect in all his ways. Amen? So the third thing is remember there are no flaws in any of the ways, anything that the Lord thinks, anything that the Lord does. I heard a minister one time years and years ago, and he didn't know any better. I had to straighten him out. But he said, oh, God's made a mistake. He can make a mistake. And you might say, well, how come my life then is not all together? Because, now please, I want you to hear this. It has to do with me. Because we really don't listen to him all that well. We like to think we do, but we really don't. Because how do we know? Because of the silly things we do or allow. Instead of reasoning and going to God and said, Lord, I need, I need your insight on these areas, we jump out and say, oh, it feels kind of good. And, and, and pretty soon, after a while, Satan will get, get, get in on how you operate, and pretty soon he'll start suggesting a few things. Watch you jump here and watch you move there. How many know that a young child, maybe a two- or three-year-old, loves to knock things onto the floor to watch mommy boogie around to pick it up? And Satan loves to do the same thing with the church, make suggestions, tell you this, tell you that, get you to do something you shouldn't be doing because you hadn't gone to God first. Next thing you know, you're, you're also, you're working against yourself. We don't want that to happen because God is far more wise and more perfect to operate in your life. So let's find out what it really means for Jesus to be the shepherd and the bishop of our souls, okay? All right, fourthly, I want to show you something. So we got a little picture for you that I hope Danny will put up right now. This is called a sheep gate. Amen. And so I'll wait just a moment until I pop that baby up. All right, everybody. I'm going to turn around, but I'm not going to move. Sheep gate. You see it? Notice that it's, it's corralled all around with rock. They didn't have many trees back then. It's a desert. And you have it, notice a little gate in the center there. But you notice there's no door there. So... The sheep, when it comes time to rest at night, will follow the shepherd into the sheep gate and find rest. There's no wolves. There's nothing there. And then the shepherd of the sheep will sit at the door and be the door. And he will sit in between the doorposts and guard it. And he will sleep there all night long. And he will guard his rod and his staff with him. And the sheep can rest. And they can relax and nibble and with each other. Now, also, I want to share something. Also, they kept a few goats in the pen, too. And the goats kept everything kind of stirred up. 
But the goats would be the first ones to re react whenever there was a intruder coming by or a wolf. We notice because sheep are very tranquil. They're not supposed to be riled up. <laughs> You're never supposed to be stressed or riled up. It's unhealthy. <laughs> you understand? And so by us allowing our shepherd to shepherd us, we can rest in the sheep gate. Amen. So you got an idea with a sheep gate? Periodically, maybe I'll have Danny pop that up one more time as we continue on. All right, go with me to John chapter 10, please. We're going to look at very familiar scripture, verses 1 through 4. John 10. Sorry, it's not 1, but it's 7 through 10. Sorry. Nope, sorry, I got several of them. It's one through four, all right. So, most assuredly I say to you, who's speaking? Jesus. He who does not enter the, sh uh, the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So you saw the door, didn't you? So if any other intruder tries to get into the sheep gate, we know they're not of God. Can you say amen? If we know that the wolf tries to crawl up some other way, right? So they're protected. Because you have to come through the door to get to the sheep. Amen. That is if you put Jesus at your door. And you don't try to stick your head out too much. All right, moving quite along. And he says, look, it says, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now you can understand seeing and remembering that picture. And he, to him, the doorkeeper opens. Now before the shepherd is chosen, what has happened is usually there is a hireling. The hireling keeps the sheep temporarily until a shepherd is chosen to really watch the sheep. And today, we have many churches with hirelings. Whenever it gets tough, they get splitting because they're not invested in the sheep. But a true shepherd of God, Jesus being the perfect shepherd, is invested in us. Amen. He's invested in his flock. Can you say amen? And the under shepherds, those under Jesus that are pastors, we are, should be committed to our flocks. Can you say Amen. That means we're going to love you no matter what you look like. Amen. Let's go on past that. All right, so it goes on then. To him, the doorkeeper, you know, the hireling opens and the sheep hear his voice. Okay? And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. You know, the shepherd gets to know all the little things about his sheep. Right? And the sheep get to know the shepherd's voice. They can recognize. So if somebody comes in that's a hireling and says, hey, sheep, come on, sheep, do the sheep call, they're not going to look at him like anything. Are we that used to Jesus, our shepherd, that we don't listen to a stranger's voice? Are you beginning to see the picture? We've been living far below the care of our shepherd. And he wants to care for us so bad, but we keep leaping out of his arms we could run it out like a goat. You see, sheep follow. They're healthier in flocks. They're healthier in groups. Not scattered, right? But goats, they wander about. They're great sentinels. But you know what? A goat is really tough to get them to be committed. Hello? But a few goats will be committed when there's sheep together unified. So you play into that as you see the Lord speaking to you. Okay, so that goes on. And when he brings his own sheep, he calls, goes before them, and his sheep follow him for they know his voice. Now drop down to verse 7. John 10, verse 7. And then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. 
Now, do you get it? He sleeps right there, okay? He's the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Now, can you tell me why? Why can't religion get to heaven? Why couldn't the Jewish people, through sacrifices, please God all the time? Because of the human frailty of the flesh. Amen? Remember, you weren't born the way you were because of your choice. Adam caused the problem. And because we are thrown into this sin corral, the only way that we can escape is to accept our shepherd and allow him to bishop our souls, which means he oversees the choices that we make. Before we open our mouth and insert foot and say something goofy, think a minute. All right. So then Jesus said, most assuredly, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. See the sheep pen, you know, and will go in and out. See the sheep go in and out by day, and they find pasture. We're going to get to the, the shepherd psalm here in just a minute and give you the depth of it. The shepherd psalm is the most perfect psalm. The second most perfect psalm is Psalms 91 for your protection. Now, some people, when they read the shepherd psalm, they go, oh, isn't that really good? If I could only live up to that. You don't have to live up to it. It's a reality. You just simply have to trust God in it. All right, so you're still with me? Say amen. All right, so. All right. Then it says, and my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. What are you going to do with that? Do you realize, Tina, that if you give your, you've given your heart to the Lord, no one can take you away from Jesus. The only thing that can happen is if you gave Jesus up, and I know in your right mind you're never going to do that. No one, no thief, no robber, no devil in hell can steal you from God. That would make God a wimp. Come on, look up at me. For the enemy to come in and get the victory, some people are, are saying that the enemy's getting. Amen. Including myself years ago before I understood having a right concept of who God is. Jesus is so far more powerful that he sat down and is resting and laughing at what the devil's doing. Not against his children, that, that grieves God. But what, what he's able to convince, and, and he said, wisdom will laugh at you if you don't listen to God. Proverbs chapter 1. We don't want any of that, can you say amen? We're part of the gang that follows our shepherd. Then, let's look at something else. Drop down to verse 27 and 30, John 10. And it says, my sheep, Hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. You're already tagged. What if somebody dies of cancer? That's a graduation day. Their body might have shut down, but their spirit and soul is in heaven dancing on streets of gold. They're not some poopy cloud. They have shape. They look just like them. They're just going to wait for their body, which is lying asleep in the grave, until the resurrection. Are you with me? Then he says, they shall not perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. Do you believe that? So our concept is, we're part of the inward group. And being part of the inward group means that our job is to go out into the world and share the good news and invite people into the sheep gate. 
into the kingdom, can you say amen, where they can find rest and peace and pastor. All right. So, folks, we need to trust our good shepherd. Can you say amen? Psalms 23, please. We're going to cover the first three verses, and then we're going to go all the way through it. But I just want to give some interjectional points right through there, okay? The Lord is my what? Shepherd. All right, in the Greek, it's poimine, which means an all-overseeing shepherd that allows nothing to attack its flock. The Lord is my shepherd. Now look at the next phrase. Do you believe this one? Say, I believe this with all my heart. I shall not want. Why? Because he's going to tell you about it in just a second here. Why shouldn't you want? Well, you're going to want when you try to get your own needs met. You're going to want when you worry and fret. You're going to want when you don't seek God first. These are the, the casualties of life. But as we seek our shepherd and follow him and we start our day out making sure we're in tune and we're walking with the Lord, then his wonderful care will care for us all during the day. And you won't have to worry if you're going to fall down or sit up or if it's going to fail or that's going to go down wrong. Why? Because your mind's caught up in the beauty of your shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. Did you see that phrase? Hebrew says, if necessary, he will put you in his arms and lay you into the pasture. The green pastures, not pasture. <laughs> so if you're having trouble, guess what? Jesus is going to feed you. So don't worry about, oh, I'm all going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Let the shepherd be the shepherd, please. People who make noise tip the wolf off. Too much noise. Or they're not the right kind of noise, like a joyful noise unto the Lord. Keep following me. He leads me beside still waters. Folks, have you ever been next to a river? I plan on going on vacation soon. Sitting next to a river. Still waters are where the waters flow into big pools. Easy to drink from. There's no thrashing. There's no rapids. There's no gentleness. See, sheep have to have still waters to drink. That's why when people come into a church and they stir up problems and make up lies, guess what? Out you go. Because you're stirring up God's waters and sheep need still waters to drink. Amen. And you're smart enough, sheep, to not draw too much attention to yourself, right? Stir up any of those waters. Moving right along. <laughs> I'd love you. All right. He leads me beside still waters. He what? Restores my soul. Well, Pastor Kerry, how often should our soul, be, our soul be restored? Every day. Your soul goes through challenges every day. Have you noticed that? Uh oh, here comes Sister So and so, going to be a challenge. Uh oh, here's the thing it's going to be a challenge. So, what do you do? Amen. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Let me say it this way in the Hebrew. He leads me in paths of God's doing right in me. God's rightness in me. Not me doing right for God. No, his rightness working in me. Amen. Samson, every time he got it right, things happened good. Every time Samson got into the flesh, he got a haircut. Moving right along. Same thing happened to Paul, you know. Every time Paul got arrested or in trouble, one time he shaved his head trying to be like a Jew again. Every time he did was going against his calling. Sure, his heart went out for him. Sure, he was a Jew. Sure, but he was called to the Gentiles. See, when you're called to do something, stop doing what you're doing and start doing what he's doing. You'll find rest. Woohoo, glory to God. Amen. All right, so, all right. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. See, God wants to glorify 
himself through you. Say amen, somebody. Amen. I'm going to turn my page. The next point I want to give you is the source of rest is who? Jesus Christ, right? Being in his guidance and knowing that it's flawless, all those paths are past then of righteousness. Now, there is a way that seems right unto a man, and the end thereof are the ways of death. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Narrow is the way that leadeth to heaven, and broad is the way that lead to destruction. People, you know, I never used to get that years and years ago until God said, hey, the narrow way is Jesus. The broad way is doing it your way. You want to keep doing it your way? You're going to be a casualty. You'll wear out. You'll be like somebody throwing sand in the engine. You won't notice it right away, but eventually you will gouge everything apart. That's what sin does if we don't Keep ourselves clean in the presence of God. I'm clean, clean, clean. Well, remember what you did back then? And remember back then? How about a week ago when you did this, when you did that? Who's our accuser? Same. Somebody bringing up your past? Smile at him and say, let me remind you. You keep buddying up with the devil. I'll remind you about your future. It's kind of fiery. So let's move on. I don't want to meddle there too much. Amen. So the source of our peace is Jesus and following his flawless guidance system will help us make heaven. Can you say amen? All right, my next point is the valley of the shadow of death. What is it? Everyone point to the earth. The world is the valley of the shadow of death. What happened? Why is it? I thought this is a pretty good place. It is. I love to fish. I love to go on vacations. I love to see the beauty of God's handiwork. Amen. But that's not what I'm talking about. Satan is the God of this world. And he set up a system called the valley of the shadow of death. Notice it's a valley. Notice it's a shadow, not a real substance. And notice it's a reflection shadow of death. So look at what this says. I love this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now you know what it what is. You're in the world, but not of the world. I will fear no evil. Why? We're encompassed round about with the shepherd. He guides us to the green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He's restoring our soul. I ain't got time to worry about what the devil's doing. I'm too busy serving God and winning souls. For he that wins souls is wise. That's where I believe a lot is wrong with the church. We stop winning souls and we start babysitting each other. I'm going to leave it right there at that. Because when we get to babysitting, then we get to telling everybody, your nighttime is this, and you better do this, and you got to do that. We're not babysitters. That's God's job. Can you say amen? <laughs> All right, now look at this. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Yeah. Folks, there are four revelations of your relationship with God. Number one, God is with you, Emmanuel. God is too, for you. For if God be for us, who can be? And God is in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you are seated with Christ, seated in Christ in heavenly places. So you are in God. What in the world is the devil doing? Trying to get you to not believe the things that God has given you so righteously and freely through Jesus Christ. Now, are we going to believe it? Or are we going to act like we don't? The valley is shadow of death. You know what that is. We don't fear because God has not given us a spirit of fear. And then the rod and the staff, we're going to find out what they are. So go down a little further in Psalms 23. Look at verse 5 and 6. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Folks, do you realize what he just said? 
That means you're having steak on your plate right in the face of the devil while he's weeping and crying and knows he's going to hell. How, why would you say something like that, Pastor? Aren't you afraid of the devil? I thought my, my Jesus whipped him. I thought every time he comes against me, he comes against Jesus and he whips him again. And you know, the devil is pretty smart to figure out every time he comes against somebody like you or me where Jesus is out in front leading our life that Satan is going to get a black eye, a beat up face and get tromped all off. But we don't think that way, folks. We think, oh, what am I going to do? I better, 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 better. Come on now. You're under the care of the great shepherd. Amen. I know I hammed it up a little bit. It must look awful in film, but I'll watch it a little later. Serious. You got it made. You got it made in the shade, or is it the shadow? You got it made, but you got to settle in and trust the Lord. Watch your mouth when you get ready to speak goofy things. Watch your thinking and command your thoughts to come in line with the Word of God. But don't let yourself wander all around and think you're not going to get an arrow in your back. And don't be picking on other people's faults because as you do, you'll be picked on yourself. So let's avoid all of that and let's eat of green pastures beside still waters. And let's get our soul more restored and let's become happy. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. So, our cup going to run over because you realize this truth that God has given us. You prepared a table before me in the presence of my en enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell. Dwell where? In the hospital? Home and not go to church? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Folks, I like to put this out. This is funny. If you're not used to going to church now, better get used to it in heaven because you'll be there for the first 6,000 years learning and changing the bad habits you have now. Well, I thought we were going to just be perfect when we get to heaven. Yeah, but you're still going to learn things because God's been busy all these years. Moving right along. <laughs> I meddle with you a little bit. Kind of think about this now. Okay? Those who are born again have perfect provision. Say amen. amen. We are anointed. That means we are owned by God. He put a seal on our forehead. He put the anointing in our life. He's the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. He protects us and cares for us. And while we're sleeping in the pen, Jesus is up at night guarding us and protecting us and strengthening us. Amen. And so no wonder when you wake up in the morning, first thing out of your mouth should be, thank you, Lord. Somebody said, well, living in this life is a gamble. Yep. So you better ways with Jesus. So let's, are you under the good shepherd? Do you know what an under shepherd is? I hate to use me as an example, but I'm an under shepherd. That means my good shepherd is my example, but I'm under shepherd under him with a flock. So that means that I have to give a greater account than just being a regular believer. So how I teach you, what I teach you, how I love you, care for you, pray for you, are all crucial as an under-shepherd. First Peter chapter, one, uh, chapter 5, verse 1 says, And the elders which are among you I exhort, who also am a, felder, a fellow elder, and a witness of the suffering of Christ, that you also and a partaker of his glory, and that you also shepherd the flock of God who is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, you better get with, get with it, but willingly, not in dishonest gain, hey, I need another car, nor as being lords over those that are entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, and then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. 
You know, if I don't line up with that, just go and talk to my wife. <laughs> Moving right along. Jeremiah 3.15 says this, And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Really, it's the things that we understand is what's working in our life. Not the things that we know about. It's the things we understand. Amen. And then, First Peter 2, 24 and 25, it says, Who his own self bear our own sins in his own body on the tree, that he might... Uh, excuse me, that he... On the tree, excuse me, and we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were, you were healed. For you were all like sheep going astray and having now returned to the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. How many know you got to do that on a daily basis? Otherwise, we'll see you somewhere else, you know. What do you mean by that? Well, because... Walking after the flesh is not a positive thing. We don't want that to happen. And do you know what Paul said in Acts 20 concerning the church? Listen to what Paul said, and this is my last scripture for you. I've got to take a sip of this. Well, I stood on my feet the whole sermon. I hope I didn't. That's really good, having my toe removed and all. And so I'll thank you for your prayers. One other thing for fun. How many know that I had a pink thing? Yeah. Now it's green. Matches my shirt and my pen. Just joking with you. I love to have fun serving God. Amen. Acts 20, look at verse 28. Therefore take, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will try to come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, going against the vision of the church, to draw away disciples after themselves. Common problems, aren't they? What should the sheep be doing? Paying attention to the shepherd. You see a wolf? Let the goats pop it off. They're the first one to predict trouble. Sometimes we'll have a one or two come in and they'll just pick on every fault that we have. We can tell, hey, there's some trouble. We need to straighten up some things. <laughs> Amen. So God bless you. God keep you. God watch over you. Order your steps. His face shine upon you. May your life be filled with his provision and his strength in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.